Good evening. Oh, I can't hear you. Why that? Ah, I can hear you now. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing well, dude. Um, I just got to make sure I look cool. You know, <laughs> yeah, you're doing the music star thing. It looks good. Yeah, it could be a music <laughs> It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. How's uh, Chai Town? It's okay. It's uh, it's cold at the minute, and we're actually um, we're we're moving down the grades on on COVID. They're they're opening up the restaurants again and letting people go in. Only twenty five percent, but you know, it's better than nothing. I I guess so. I'm sorry. I'm just looking for a. Okay, I'm all good. I just got AirPods yesterday. Oh, did you? And and now I'm just <laughs> devastated at the thought of losing them. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've stayed clear for that exact reason. I bought Kirsten for Christmas. She'd been wanting so many. I got her them as one of her Christmas presents, and she'll look after them really well. Whereas I am notorious for destroying headphones and sunglasses in particular, <laughs> or just losing them. Um, you know, that's a it's a high risk item. Yeah, but it's one of those things where you make the gamble. Is the fear of the financial hit from this <laughs> to somehow inspire me to be a more be a different person than I am. Yeah. And you can always convince yourself that it will. <laughs> you know, uh, these are evidence that it is a winning strategy. These are expensive because they're prescription. Yeah. Look, yeah. I haven't lost them. Looked after in bed. Yeah. They're right here. Yeah, we were just talking about this before because Kirst is in one of those moods where she's selling loads of stuff that we don't use anymore and she was digging out sunglasses and she was like really raking me over the coals about losing sunglasses. And then then she goes, oh, have you still got those, was it like AVAs or something that you had from, it was like honeymoon when I bought it. I was like, yeah, I have actually. So there you go, right? Like they were, and it's the same thing, right? I bought them, I've never we'd come over to New York for honeymoon and a few other places and I bought them in Macy's and I was like, I really treasured them. So I kind of looked after them all the time. Yeah. Sometimes things hook in. Something in it. There's something in it. <laughs> what kind of guitars um, do you have back there? Sorry? What kind of guitars do you have back there? Oh, I've got, I've got a few actually. Um, I'm really, uh, I've, can you see? You probably can't. No, I can't. I got a banjo for, I got a banjo for Christmas. I've never played banjo before. <laughs> Um, that's that's a, just a Taylor acoustic. This is you got a telly, a 335, telly, and this is a guy. No, this is a guy in the UK called John Case oh. who like builds guitars in his house, and you can spec them yourself. So this, I always loved 335s, and I never they were very expensive, and I couldn't find one that I really liked. So this is his take on it, and you could spec the whole thing yourself. So I got like a yeah. between a P90 in the neck, which sounds awesome. Annoying. and then that one at the end is that was my 40th birthday surprise gift from my family and my wife it's a j45 J40, from, j45 yeah from like 1970 1969 70 something oh like my that. god it was um it was a nice there's a place in have you ever been to chicago music exchange I've actually never been there. Yeah, it's it's like it's awesome, and it's um like I used to like going in there just to look around, and and that I picked that up one time I went in. It's not at all like the kind of acoustic guitars I like. I don't normally pick those kind up, and I um played, and it was uh, loved it, like absolutely loved it. And every time we went back in, I would play, and um think yeah one day because it was expensive, like one day maybe I'll buy that. And then, then we went in maybe a month before my birthday and it was gone. And I was like, God damn it. I was going to like get that at some point. And then on my birthday morning, it was at the bottom of the bed and Kirst had gone in. She oh. watched which one I was playing and <laughs> bought it without me knowing. And like all my family had chipped in for my 40th birthday. Oh my and God. God. That. It was the best birthday present, honestly. <laughs> those, peop those people love you, Phil. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, that, that really was it. Uh, unique it was a it was a good present that <laughs> yeah there's the proof man it's i'm so happy to have i mean i'm not a great player or anything like that but 
through this last year, you know, being locked inside, just having the ability and the like the instruments to play some music is it like a blessing. It really is. It, like I can't get that across to people enough. So I encourage people at work and stuff. I'm like, do you play an instrument? No, I'm like, well, get one. Like this is a perfect time, right? You're locked inside. Yeah. Do it. Like now, now, now is yeah. the time. Mm. It makes a it makes a huge uh, difference. <laughs> I feel the same way. I mean, yeah. I haven't had this kind of time to devote to that since I was a teenager, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And how's it? Um, I mean, how you, I, I wanted to, I thought it would be a good time just to catch up because what's been really sort of impressive to me is how busy you've stayed during, during lockdown, seemingly uh, with the various, you were, you were, if, actually you were the last live show that I saw before lockdown. You and you were with Jack Broadbent at the city winery and she, oh, oh yeah 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 and um that was it like uh i think cursed shot another show the very next night in city winery uh i can't remember who it was and then she didn't shoot anymore um but yeah then that that was the end of live shows that was the, the last one we went to um which is crazy because it's such a big part of our lives with the website and everything that it's like you take that away and it takes a lot away <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I, once again, I completely yeah. understand. And, it, and obviously, all, yeah, a whole, of, <laughs> a whole of the level for musicians, obviously, who depend on that income. <laughs> it's a strange situation, hmm. you know, but it's also, I think, at least in my experience, I felt uniquely prepared for it because I'm just used to not making money sometimes or <laughs> not <laughs> or just or things being in such flux that that's yeah. just something that I gotten used to so yeah that I, I I did even though it was obviously a huge adjustment with yeah. the pandemic it wasn't like oh my god my you know my weekly paycheck I was like oh. yeah <laughs> yeah whatever <laughs> now, I've been kind of lucky in terms of my job is I mean, it's just kept going, right? But it's working from home, and it's a uh, like, like honestly, that's the that's been the challenge for me because one of the parts of my job I like the most was I used to get to go all over the country um, for right. a job, like meet clients and stuff like that. And then I would always try and see the places I went to or build something in, like go and see a show or something like that. So I saw you guys, I saw Honey Honey in Salt Lake City, which was just total spur of the moment, um, right. where I just managed to fit it in. So. It's a bit of a downer just being sitting in front of a laptop all day, <laughs> not doing the fun piece. That was a big adjustment. Mm. Um, just that much. I mean, I think a lot of people in my position have just gotten so much more tech fluent than yeah. we've ever been in the last year, which yeah. has been great in a lot of senses. But I just don't like staring at a computer all fucking day. <laughs> I mean, who? Not, not many yeah. people. Actually, that's not true. I think a lot of people do, but I just, <laughs> people, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not. I just don't have the neck for it. You know? <laughs> I am, um, you took, I mean, I remember speaking to you at the show and I'd seen you a couple of times performing the new music af after A Wild Ocean of Love. Um, so like the, you know, the Billy stuff, the story. Right. And I, it was really disappointing because i remember speaking to you at city winery and you had the show coming up i think at hotel cafe when you were going to do it with all the multimedia and everything and but then you switched gears obviously when it happened and did the stream yeah. every Sunday night and honestly like thanks for doing that because it became sort of a in those early weeks of lockdown we were like looking forward to sunday nights because we would watch joe pug did a, a regular Sunday stream. So we would watch him and then we would watch your stream after that. Um, and it was, I wanted to talk to you a bit about that actually, because I remember we talked when you did All Wild Ocean of Love and that was like, I loved that album. I think when we talked about nice. it, I said it was, a, it was like a really eclectic album, but it just hung together really well at the same time. And then this is like a totally different approach, right? To, and, and this one, did you always foresee it being rather than just being a straight album always being this kind of like live or multimedia kind of experience to deliver it yeah yeah i 
we had in Honey Honey, our last big project was this TV show. Oh yeah. Called, called The Guest Book. Yeah. Um, and we had to, especially by the second season, we were writing, you know, basically an album's worth of originals, but they're all based on story points. Yeah. Right. So we get the script and, you know, have to write a song that reflected it. And I had such a, I don't know, create whatever crazy experience doing that. I would, I would get this script mm. and then write a song. It would take 20 minutes and it'd yeah. be done. And I was like, <laughs> well, it, it was just, it, it was so fluid mm. that I kind of got in touch with that, um, I guess understanding how to orient myself around songwriting. I mean, uh, I'm now going down this kind of psychological rabbit hole, but the point of what I'm saying is I thought, okay, this is interesting to be able to hinge these song ideas on a narrative. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's where the Billy thing came out of. Yeah, I, it came out of that and also wanting to create just a more of a, a storytelling experience I felt I kept listening to Kendrick Lamar's records I just yeah. thought and I still think that they're the best records that yeah. <laughs> anybody's done in a decade um, and there's just such a strong sense of storytelling in hip-hop at least at the you know the highest levels of it yeah and I just thought well god this in the music community that I'm in I just don't experience that no I don't see that much I mean in rock I guess in the 70s and kind of throughout there's been this string or stream of more you know conceptual records but anyway I just felt like wait I I want to I want to be a storyteller yeah in a, in a direct way um and so that's that's kind of the basis of it and then I mean, how did you, I guess, how did you go about it? Did you, so the story of Billy, I guess, did you come up with a story first and then write around it? Is it drawn out of experience? Is it, I was just wondering how you like created the story or what, what the idea was behind it. Well, there's a couple ideas, but the biggest one, the thing that blew my mind, I started playing the Billy stuff um, with the dead horses when I'm touring with the yeah. dead horses. So the, I think those are the first shows where I played them live. And I just kept having this crazy experience where I'd kind of talk, I'm kind of a blabbermouth, so I'd talk it through a little bit during the shows and string the songs together that way. But I realized how, in, how little information I had to share yeah. for people to completely illustrate it themselves. Yeah. Um, so I, I just started to play with that visually too, because there's some video pieces that I played in the soothing stream that are part of that live show. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's the idea, I guess, I don't, I don't know. It's just the idea of, a, you know, like this, these sunglasses, they've had a history. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. an entire story to these sunglasses, whether you give a shit about it or not. Yeah. But if if I present them to you, it's tough on Zoom, but if I present them to you in an interesting way, yeah, all of a sudden you create the story yeah. around it. So I I mean, not to say that there isn't a through line with Billy, but I think I really w was interested in that. Yeah. And it yeah. works. I mean, I think like honestly, I remember talking to you about. A wild ocean of love at the time and I can't like I can't remember actually what we I think we were talking about you'd said something once in an interview about how you kind of you know not a big one to sort of get in touch with your feelings when you're writing so sometimes the songs are a metaphor for something else and it was what I liked about a wild ocean was I think that allowed the listener to put a lot of their own onto those songs because you could take it a lot of different you could take the songs a lot of different ways it was yeah. uh, and, and it's but i guess this is like a whole other level of that that's just like taking it the next step <laughs> uh, well i kind of came across i came to that realization i guess a couple of years ago that i i write a lot by proxy and maybe i told you that we talked about that in our 
yeah, a little bit, yeah. But you know, I had the the first song. Well, one of the first songs of mine that kind of opened up a bigger or, or a more of a career path yeah. was called Little Toy Gun. Yeah. Um, you know, so and I just realized like, okay, wait, I can use these symbols or I, I ideas that are outside of myself to kind of access a part of me that's more difficult yeah. for whatever reason. Maybe I'm getting better at it. I don't know. I'm about to go on a bit of a writing bender the next couple of weeks and we'll see yeah. but, but you know it's it's i think it is a way for people to have touchstones in the sense of okay i can still relate to this and and for me to kind of trick myself into being vulnerable you know yeah yeah i like i kind of like that idea and you get i think it's been interesting for me living in the US, coming from the UK, because it sort of exposed me to so much different music that I wouldn't have heard, right? I mean, I probably, you know, a lot of country music, actually. And when you talk about sort of storytelling, it's not in the same format because they're telling the whole story in the space of one song, right? right. But it's like I, I came across all those artists, like some of the artists over here that I love, in that kind of area, like Jason Isbell, and uh, there's a guy called John Morland from Oklahoma. Yep. Like those guys, the way that they write songs and it's it's a story and you know it's got characters and everything like that. I love that. And then at the same time, I love you know something like Oh Wild Ocean or something like one of Joe Pug's album where it, it's all like imagery and you can make that song mean whatever you want. And you know I've heard him interviewed before where he's like, people write me with all these. They're like, oh, is him 101 about this? I think it's this and it's this. And he's like, it's got fuck all to do with any of that. But like, right. you think that's what it is? That's great. And and I kind of like that as well. And I'm always, when I do interview people, I'm always hesitant to say, especially if it's a song that really means a lot to me, like what what did that mean when you're writing it? Because they might say something that then totally changes it. Right. My mind, <laughs> like, yeah, it's, not as good. it's like the whole Neil Young thing. <laughs> where he's always writing about a car yeah and, you know you, you think it's a woman but uh, yeah um, it's always like have you yeah. read your biographies what's that have you read neil young's old biographies no i never got into it it's nuts it, i mean literally the first one every chapter it'll talk about a car that he's driven in like so you know he collects all the old cars and then he got really big into sort of electric and started building actual electric cars he formed a company but, but he would like to say, he'd be telling a story about his past and he was like, at this time I had a Chevy hearse because he used to drive around in a hearse and it had a whatever engine in it. So I drove down, <laughs> it's, it's really ridiculous. Like I drove down Sunset and would have emitted X tons of CO2 during that drive. Oh my God. <laughs> in every chapter. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, holy shit. He was really like, it's obviously just on his mind and he couldn't like get it. So into it. Yeah. Um, but I kind of, I, I kind of love that about him as well. He's one of those guys that I admire and he just doesn't give a shit what anybody else thinks. That, that is admirable for sure. And that was one of the reasons, though, along the same lines that I couldn't, he, his last book had a war in the title. Oh, and yeah, um, Waging Heavy Peace or something. Wasn't that, it? Yeah, maybe that's yeah. it. And I, that was, I couldn't get into it because he kept talking about model trains. And I'm, just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, like, I'm, not, I'm not interested yeah. in that, Neil. Yeah. So, but he doesn't care what I think, and that's fine. <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh, it's interesting to watch. I, we saw, him, I actually saw him live for the very first time at Farm Aid. We were covering it for the website two years ago, and he's still one of my favorite guitarists. Oh, nice, <laughs> like to watch live because he's not a technical guitarist, but man, when he plays a solo, it looks like he's trying to snap the guitar in half. It's right. awesome. I love watching him do it. It's, uh, uh, it's really, uh, it's really impressive to watch. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that too. So in terms of um, in terms of writing, actually, one other thing I wanted to ask you about enlightenment was, I mean, is there or, or had you gone down the route of recording any of those songs for an album, or was it always the intention with that one that it would only just be for sort of live consumption? Well, I'm, it it started out um, it started out uh, as a record. I wanted to make a kind of a 
something that felt like a podcast yeah. to listen to. So you could listen to it and sink into a narrative uh, with a with a kind of an ambient uh, audio atmosphere and musically. Yeah. Um, so, but but then I was, you know, since Honey Honey, I've had to kind of reforge my relationship with building a community around what I'm doing because, yeah. you know, we got to a point where there was an audience that could support us. Yeah. And that I, I just kind of sunk into that, I don't know, approach. We're like, okay, cool. We'll make a record. And then our people will listen to the record and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And post honey, honey, that has not been my experience. It's been <laughs> yeah. creating, you know, kind of not starting from scratch at all because yeah all that experience is so informative, but uh, understanding, well, how, how do I want to occupy the world as, uh, yeah. as an artist, you, you know? And I thought, you know what? I just want to take care of my city. That's what I want to do. Yeah. I want to focus on LA and I want to perform here. And I want to do things that I don't think are being done because they, sh because I think they should be. Yeah. And that, that was my game plan. So I started doing these Billy shows and we, you know, put a lot of love into that first one. And it was great. It was, they got a huge, really wonderful response and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, then COVID happened. So that whole strategy just yeah. kind of changed. Yeah. But now I'm in the process. This is kind of embarrassing to admit, but I'm about to release in a few weeks, the first of these Bill Enlightened with, with Billy songs. Oh, um and uh, um, but but it's the fourth time I've recorded at least this song. Yeah. Like I I kind of sketch and then do another sketch and do another one and then you know and I'm now I'm finally at this place and I'm still gonna release two versions because I'm such a <laughs> weirdo. But um, yeah, so so it was conceptualized as an album, yes, but always in Congress with this. Yeah, it must be kind of it must be quite. In a way, I mean, the most, I guess it must have been a lot of emotions going on when Honey Honey stopped, but at this, in one sense, it must have kind of been, because I imagine once you've built an audience like that, that comes with certain expectations as well in terms of what you're going to release, what you're going to write and release next, and it maybe confines you a little bit. And then it, you take the shackles off that, and it must just be like, wow, I can do anything now. Because I, I felt like that's what came out on Old Wild Ocean. It was like, that was such a creative album. And then you worked with Howard Bybush on that one, right? And it, I remember saying to you at the time, when I was reading up to interview you and I heard, oh, oh I worked with Howard Bybush, I went back and listened to Religion and I was like, holy shit, what a great record. And it That was, record is so good. Yeah, but it was, um, it, it was nice. And it was just, I was just like, wow, it, it just sounded like a kind of creative explosion, I guess, in terms of what you were doing. And that, that must have been quite a nice feeling just to have like, you know, no boundaries or no expectations as to what it was going to be. That was really nice. Yeah. And part of that, I love collaborating, but I hadn't, it'd been so long since I'd done something where I, the decisions didn't have to go through anybody else. Yeah. And that was a great experience because I just, we had a week in the studio and how we tweaked all the knobs and I played all this stuff and it was just, yeah that was it we'll see what happens and by the end of it pretty much yeah. that that's what we got is the record yeah. you know so it was it was nice to just kind of like <laughs> yeah yeah i like that record i think i remember when we talked about it and you were like a couple of those songs just dropped out at the end really fast and one of them is my favorite on the record which is pity i love that song oh, yeah. and i remember you seeing that one like you wrote like really quickly at the end whereas yeah. some of the have been like just staying for ages so <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah it was cool that one was interesting um but it's it's nice to i mean i'm all i'm such a slow releaser of things that i i generally am putting out stuff that i wrote years ago and it you know it's sometimes it, it gets tricky because it doesn't feel super fresh yeah you know mm -hmm. but on the other hand the stuff that i think is is deeper yeah can kind of sit on the shelf and I'm, I'm proud of the billy stuff and i'm excited to just start yeah getting it out there Put it that's on. good i look forward to that yeah. I, I wanted to talk a bit with you as well about the because i've seen obviously when you've been putting up you've, you've been writing music for 
TV or you've just scored a film, right? Yeah. How did that come around? How did, how did, I mean, I guess my question would be, because you seem to have a very close group of musicians in LA who you work with, like around you, Wendy Wang and Drew Taubenfeld. And, yeah. you know, you guys, you, it seems like a super creative atmosphere. And did that all come about through working with those guys? Did they do that kind of thing? Or? No, but, but it is a really, I mean, that specifically didn't, but it's yeah. a super rich community. And that's what's, it's interesting to, to think about, okay, what's going to happen when the kind of dust clears after yeah. COVID? Because I know some people have left and, but the last five years in LA have felt so good. It's just like I, I was talking to um, just some other guys in an inc incredible band and they're living in Highland Park and they're talking about, hey, this is Silicon Valley in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because yeah. it's so deep. I mean, I mean, it's a great local community. And then, oh, look, that there, there, Billie Eilish grew up over there. And yeah. there's Lewis Cole on that street. And Wolfpack is right over there. And, you know, and everybody's kind of hanging. Yeah. Uh, so it feels good. It, it has felt good in that sense. And, and really, maybe that's along the lines of what you're talking about yeah, as yeah. far as the community generating all these opportunities and ideas and kind of I had the same experience when I lived in Nashville which is two years in Nashville I was just a completely different guitar player on the yeah. other end of it just yeah. because yeah you can't, you can't help it, it. You, yeah. you know it's scared but, the crap the first, I I love Nashville I love visiting there but it I, I remember the first time I went and and I both loved it and hated it because we like we walked on to it that main street with all the, the bars and the music. Yeah, Broadway. And they're, they're like, we walk past two guys playing guitar on the street and I'm like, holy shit, they're like a hundred times better than I'll ever be. And they're playing on the street in Nashville. And oh yeah, like your Uber driver <laughs> yeah. can shred. It's a whole other level. But at the same time, I've never in my life, in my entire life, the first time we went there, I was like, I've never been anywhere like this where just everything is music, everything, all the time. Even I remember like standing at a crossing and it had a little speaker on playing music. And I'm like, this place is just, it, I've never been anywhere where it's just all about music. Yeah, it's incredible, but it's also exhausting. <laughs> and and it, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine if you're in that, it must be tiring. Yeah, and it, it doesn't necessarily mean um, it's healthy for the art. I'm not saying it's yeah. not because there, there's there's great stuff going on, but you know you don't want to get too if you're just staring in your own reflection all day, you're not yeah. really going to be able to grow. I don't I don't think or make yeah. something that is useful to other people. Yeah, I've al I've always wondered as well, and I mean you do a lot of I guess you do do quite a bit of collaboration, but that did you ever do that kind of Nashville co-writing kind of experience? Because that to me. It always kind of, I mean, I don't know, but it sounds kind of artificial. Like, like you just stick two people together and put them in a room and go, right, come up with something by five. Like a oh, day yeah. job kind of thing. I mean, that's... Oh, exactly. You yeah. two, so two songs a day, a lot of the time. <laughs> it's nuts. It's crazy. And I, used, I got this image in my head of just a pile of songs every day. Let's say just from the community of professional songwriters in Nashville, let's yeah. say a thousand songs a day are being written, you know? Yeah. So how do you, I, that always freaked me out. And I, I, I wrote with people who were those writers, but I never yeah. was a two songs a day. And you can get, I mean, every once in a while, it's, you know, sure. It's a numbers game and you, yeah. and you hit something really great, yeah. but it is, it is a day job because you're yeah. sir, you're servicing an industry. Yeah. Um, and there is a relationship to artistry for sure, but that's not necessarily what is being sold. Yeah, I get, I get where you're coming from. It, it just, yeah, it always feels to me a bit like, the, the, I don't think there's any doubt that those people are talented, but it's like, let's just throw everything at it and see what sticks, right? It's like you say, it's a numbers game, right? We're gonna write a thousand and maybe a couple of them will chart and then- Yeah, and there'll be a one, two hits, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. And then, you know, you sell them to a huge country artist and then you, you make the money on them. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, yeah. But, but, you know, like, uh, uh, there's nothing 
I can understand wanting to make a living. <laughs> you know, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's this, it's this scary with what's happened as well. I mean, not just for musicians, but I spoke to the communications director for Viva, and at, at the time that I I spoke to her, it it scared the crap out of me in terms of what was going to be on the other side of this because. They had like the list of venues who'd signed up to the Independent Venues Association. And and they were saying, I think this was like last June or July when I spoke to her, she's like 90% of our members are saying that if if they don't get some form of support, they're gonna disappear for good. And I'm like, what what would happen if that if if 90% of those actually went? And a lot of the stuff she was saying, I hadn't even considered. She's like, if, if places go in one location, it screws up entire tours because tours are booked needing to stop in a set number of locations. And I mean, it was it was worrying. I think they did get some legislation through, so it looks like they are getting they did. something, which is, which is great. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that and, and then musicians just having to really pivot and find other ways to, you know, make money and, and live stream their shows and things like that. It's, it's really been interesting. Um, but nice to also see some creativity come out of it. Yeah, I, I think that's what I kind of gravitate more towards is that it is interesting because I, I, it's, a, it's a constant kind of discussion that's being had by the marketplace. But hmm. it's like, well, how many musicians, professional touring musicians do we need? We're yeah. always finding out. I, I think we definitely got to a point where was just insanely saturated and that's okay yeah too you know it, it's just such a crazy shift because if you're thinking about it even maybe not even idealistically but just philosophically philosophically <laughs> um why wouldn't everybody why shouldn't we want everyone to play music yeah yeah right yeah to do it professionally no we don't we don't want that no, no. and 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 it's just one of those weird kind of human behaviors that we're all going to do anyway yeah. um and then an industry crops up around it but but, but I, I don't know it's just i think it's more interesting than anything else i don't know if anybody is entitled to make a living playing music no oh I don't get i mean i've got a great it, actually it's interesting when i was getting <laughs> I, I signed up, and we can talk a little bit about Honey Honey, but I signed up for your guys' podcast, like on Patreon, okay. and I was watching... We're about to do another one. Oh, yeah, excellent. I was watching the, the last one, and it was really eye-opening to me, like when you and Suzanne were talking about, you know, making that decision to be a musician, right? This is what I want to do, and this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to stick with it. And, you know, probably not getting a huge amount of encouragement when you first say that to your family and friends, like, holy shit. But the fact that you both have stuck with it and you've both made so much peace with it and you're like, yeah, I do not regret that decision at all. But I think what gets missed and I, you know, writing for the website and I talk to fans and, and people and they're like, oh, yeah, I could have, you know, I'm a good musician. I could have done that. I'm like, yeah, but could you really? You've got a job now and you're comfortable and you've got your house and you can pay your mortgage. Could you really, you know, would you really have been willing to put all that on the line and just keep going after it and going after it and going after it? And I've got a friend, I've got a good friend back in the UK who's an actor and he's done that his entire life, right? And he, he actually has had a couple of like reasonable successes now, but I always sort of envied him as well for the fact that he just had that courage to go, no, that's what I want to do and nothing else will do. And it feels like, like you and Suzanne, you've both done that and you're both perfectly happy with your decision. That's, that's true. And mm -hmm. I, 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 that's something that I'm really grateful for. Yeah. You know? I think it's, it's important. Like, that's the other thing I think. And I write about that. I remember writing the first blog that I did for the website. It's like, how important it is. How, how important that it is that there are people like you who are willing to sort of, drag yourself around the US in a car, you know, sleeping on couches and stuff like that to play music, but how important it is for the audience because if this last year has shown me anything anyway, it's how, how much of a release and how much of a, how important it was to my mental health to go and see live music. Yeah, I understand uh, that. So, but you do it too. 
Yeah. You're doing it right now. Yeah. No, but well, this is an outlet. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? You're yeah. just doing what you, I don't know, want to do, feel you should do, are interested in doing, and yeah. you continue to do it. We've been talking for years. Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> and, and I think it's, I don't see that as any different, you know, and, and actually I, I admire that hugely because you do have another job. Yes. You know what I mean? And, and you still do it. Yeah. I, I think about that sometimes too, because obviously it crosses your mind. Okay. Well, wh- what if I am in a situation where I can't support myself yeah. with my skill set or whatever, with my music. Um, and I, I think of myself as, okay, well, I obviously still play. I'd wake up at 5 AM every day, yeah. but now who the fuck knows? I, you know, it's, <laughs> having doing work takes energy it doesn't matter what kind of work it is it and does. yeah I, I think what you realize and I, I i imagine you experience is that a certain type of work gives back a lot more than it takes yeah um and that's how i feel about music i i never really think about you know schlepping around the states or anything like that i all of that completely pales in comparison to how much i gain yeah. from it yeah you know it, it's a, it's a it's kind of my lens for the world at, at this yeah. point you know i like it it was it it was really i was i think i was listening to that while i was walking dave 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 is our dog so like <laughs> that sounds a bit weird when i'm like when i was walking dave hey. i was looking at him so I was, and I was listening to that one and it just like, it made me pause as I was listening to it. Cause I was like, man, that's good that you, you guys both feel that way. It made me happy that it was there. Good. Okay. Um, but I, I, joined, I totally like went off track there. So in terms of the film that you've scored, so how did that one come around? How did you, how did you get sort of tapped up for, for that? Well, I'd always wanted to do film stuff, mm. film scoring. Um, and, you know, eventually living in Los Angeles, the opportunity just came around. I'd scored several at, at this point, short films. Yeah. And one of them, uh, was directed by the director of this feature length okay. film. And I just, I just made it so fucking clear that I wanted, I wanted a chance to do this and I could do it. And she's a fan of, of Honey Honey and stuff like that. So she, you know, I wasn't just kind of a, some chum begging her for it but I, I just made it very clear that I wanted a, an opportunity with her short film to, yeah. to score it and uh eventually was granted that opportunity and you know did a good job I wouldn't say I did a great job but I did a good enough job and that you know we we kind of we her and I the director whose name is Joey Joey Alley yeah. um have a good collaboration at this point yeah and yes yeah, she she's a dynamo so she was able to pull together this film that she wrote directed and starred in um which is insane <laughs> yeah uh you know and and pulled in a lot of support for got a real budget to do it um you know production company side on uh, bruce dern is in it oh, nice. um, i don't know if you know, you know that guy yeah, um, like <laughs> yeah. So, so it was cool, and 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 I kind of just have been a collaborator of hers for years now. So went through this process with her, which was a lot. I mean, scoring a film is crazy. To was yeah. crazy to me. I mean, it's it was so much work, and so much of that work came from my ignorance of yeah. the process and. And also just kind of this new medium where you're playing with something that won't change what it's doing <laughs> for what you're doing. Yeah. You know, it, it responds because you play, a, a, I just tried to strum a guitar chord. You know, <laughs> yeah. you play a certain chord and the scene completely changes and feels different. But, you know, you, you are scoring the picture. It's not... Uh, uh, the you. priority is the picture, not the music. And then, in, so in terms of, because this is always interesting to me as well, like in terms of the process, how does it start? Do you get like a, because 
because is the movie made at any point? So are you watching it and then deciding how you would score that scene or do you read the script or is it, how does it? Well, I was in a pretty unique position because I was so close with the director. Yeah. Usually this would never happen. And there were things that were great about it and things that totally burned me from being that close to the process. But, I, you know, I'd read the script before they shot it. And I actually, there was a musical number. She wanted there to be a musical number. So yeah. I wrote, honestly like 15 songs to try and work out something for this musical number finally we arrived at it and then it got cut oh my. <laughs> but but well, you know whatever um <laughs> but that that song actually became kind of the source for themes throughout the movie so yeah. i still pluck melodies from that song and use this thematic elements and blah 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 yeah. um but uh yeah well what ideally you would have is what's called a locked cut. Yeah. So the, the edit is done and you're, the way I feel about it is, is the composer is the first person to really provide commentary yeah. for the film. It's the first audience kind of. Yeah. And you say, okay, boom, this is, this is how I react and thus will I score. You know, obviously the director's choice is whether to kind of embrace that tone or, or not, but yeah, you know, you 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 basically try and support the narrative with with the music. I mean, that's that's the long and short of it, I guess. And then it, it, that must be a hugely collaborative process with the director as well, right? Because they've got to oh, feel yeah. that what you that you're setting the right tone, I guess, with what you are doing. Yeah. Exactly, and that was such a different thing for me musically, which I was super excited about because I'm not used to having such a command of harmony and melody. Yeah. I'm used to writing songs and what I say is what goes and, you know, we kind of shape things around that. And even just the way that at least kind of folk music is written, you have these fairly simple and consistent chord cycles, you yeah. know? Yeah. One, six, two, five, one, four, five. Like that's how it goes. Yeah. Um, but this this was a something that I've been curious about and kind of longing to dust it up with was this approach and understanding to harmony um, that I, I don't know, it's classical, but that's not the right term for it. But yeah. just the idea that these are how how do I explain it it's like building a solid structure out of moving parts yeah. you know what i mean so you're yeah. taking something that's going to arrive at a finished product but everything you do is like <laughs> writhing and twisting <laughs> like, yeah it's uh, it must be that must be i, I don't know it's, it's again like when i look at what you're doing and at least what you've done in the last sort of couple of years it feels like it's been a really creative time for you. You know, even through this lockdown, I mean, doing something brand new that takes you outside your comfort zone like that, you know, as well as you've written new music, you know, you've done the, the live streams and everything like that. It's a, it, it's a, it's a great thing. I think it's like, you're, you're sort of on that side of the lockdown experience. I know some people have just sort of shut down and they're like, yeah, I'm just waiting until we can come outside again, you know, when we get the vaccine or whatever. And then other people, it's been like this amazing creative time for them. And it seems like it's kind of been like that for you. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I, I remember in the very early stages, the Soothing Stream stuff. Yeah. It was just, it was the first time in, yeah, I don't know, I guess probably my whole professional life where there's no money. There's yeah. money money's off the table, so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I was like, all right, then I am just going to do whatever I want to do. Exactly what you want. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's where it was. Yeah, it was. A, it was. And I mean, it, it was like it was a great help early on when we were all like scared and didn't know what was going on. And there was something <laughs> to sort of anchor onto every week. Uh, like, oh, we'll watch that on something. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then I saw as well yesterday, which is good timing for this interview, that you, the guest book got reviewed. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, we just yeah. we just found out about that yesterday too. That's awesome. Well, it, it didn't get renewed. It got 
picked up by Hulu. Oh, by Hulu, yeah, that was it. Yeah. So you, you're gonna, yep. you're gonna you're gonna be in every episode again? Suzanne Santo. <laughs> okay. Um well we, yeah, they're they're so what they're doing, the show was originally on cable yeah. on TBS and Hulu picked it up so now you can just watch stream both seasons but there's no no new episodes oh no new episodes is there a plan for some new episodes at any point i mean if there's a massive popular groundswell demanding them (laughs) i I did watch them it was a really funny show actually i liked it Uh, yeah it's pretty it's, it's pretty silly well then i guess i guess the one last thing i wanted to mention was obviously you and suzanne uh you know, played some stuff as Honey Honey again. I was, uh, I just, it just made me laugh because I was, uh, I was looking at Stitcher one day and it was like, Joe Rogan with Honey Honey. And I'm like, that must be from ages ago. And, <laughs> and it wasn't. And I was like, oh shit, they're, they're back together. And he like, got you guys on immediately, right? Like, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> we, we post the, we posted on Instagram, hey, we're, 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 playing music again and literally 20 minutes later joe's like you want to come on the show <laughs> like, uh. it must be so nice to have that level of support from him but, uh, oh yeah he yeah. he's awesome mm. and um yeah but it, it was also kind of like jesus yeah because it just the fucking put the brakes on we didn't we didn't apply the brakes but it's not like we had a new our material <laughs> we didn't have shit yeah. we were just like okay but <laughs> You know he's kind of become that uh it's more of like a friend friendship thing yeah oh it was like it was great the first time i ever interviewed you for the website and suzanne actually was when you both just done your solo stuff and i was like i need to get some background like so i've got things to talk about and i just looked at rogan's podcast i'm like right there's like 10 hours of background here um it was so crazy. it was a uh, impress you Honestly, I've got I've got a bit of a I don't know I guess you'd call it like a some kind of tick I don't know if it's like an OCD kind of thing but it drives cursed nuts which is if I hear a phrase or something that I like or a word I'll start repeating it over and over and I'll do it out loud it drives like crazy in the apartment and and I'll do it and and I think at some point she thinks I'm doing it to annoy her and I'm not because when I travel for work. I'll find myself doing it when I'm in a hotel room, just like doing it in ridiculous voices or whatever. But when I was getting ready for those interviews with you, you guys gave me one of the worst one of those I've ever had that I could not stop saying. And it was, oh God. you were told, I shouldn't say it because it's going to set me off again. Ah. You were talking about being on tour in the South somewhere. Yeah. You were in a restaurant and there was a new story on about Bobbit. You know the guy. Oh my god! Yeah, throw that dick in the middle of the highway. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, <laughs> like this. The waiters came over. It's like she just threw that dick in the street, and it like it made me laugh so much. But then I, I was saying that for honestly, Ben, like about three weeks. After. Oh my god! Because <laughs> it's like in just a variety of stupid voices, to the point where it was like I was kind of like slapping my. I was like fucking stop it! Like slapping myself in the face. That happens to me. So, so I saw the movie um, Hunt for the Wilder People. Do you know that movie? Oh, no, I don't know that. It's a, a Taika Waititi movie. Yeah. It's in, in New Zealand. Yeah. It's set in New Zealand. They're all New Zealand actors. And I talked in a New Zealand accent for weeks. I, I, I couldn't <laughs> stop. It didn't feel right to not be talking. I, it was bad. I mean, yeah, it, it's awful. I, I, it honestly, it, it really frustrates me after a while. But yeah, I shouldn't have brought that up. I don't know why I brought that up. <laughs> I shouldn't have brought it up because now I'll be doing it for the next week. Um, no, you, you're in control, Phil. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I'll tell myself. I guess last thing, are you, um, I mean, in terms of Honey Honey, are you guys writing any new music? Any plans? We haven't written anything together. Well, Suze is about to, well, at least she's finishing up another record, a solo record. Yeah. So she's focusing on that. I'm starting to release um, new music, yeah. my own. And she, I don't know, I don't think this is a secret or anything. She's moving to Austin. Oh, yeah. I, I, did, I was listening to Rogan actually when she mentioned she was probably going to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so we don't have any, we're trying to figure it out. Yeah there's just so much going on but we'll we'll get around to it i think if it's right or we're hopefully we'll have a show in six months in austin yeah you know it's kind of we'll we'll dip in and out but it's not we're not 
going hard on honey honey anytime yeah. soon no it's good yeah i just think it was good to see you guys do the live stream as well that was good exactly. yeah that was awesome yeah that felt good it was well that that's good ben i didn't have uh much else for you thanks for chatting again i uh I love, thanks I love for catch, having I love, me i love catching up it's interesting <laughs> yeah likewise likewise well love to you guys both yeah um and uh you know hopefully we'll see you in uh in a venue Sometime. yeah that would be that would be really nice it'd be nice if that happens like sometime this year any venues <laughs> yeah i feel the same way all right phil well have a great night and let me you know if, if you need anything else no i can uh... yeah we'll just we'll just put this one up as a, a video on the youtube channel okay see you dude thanks man bye